Great, we're very glad to have Daniel Rudenko from the University of Chicago, and he's going to tell us about rational elliptic surfaces and trigonometry of non-Euclidean tetrahedra. Thank you very much. It's a great, great pleasure and honor to give a talk here. So the talk will be very informal, in a sense, very elementary. And my main goal is to, um, is to actually explain what I don't understand as a story, and there is much which I don't understand. So basically, there are some results which I will explain, which have a very um, sadly computational proofs. And I think that uh, it will be interesting to find much more conceptual approaches. So this is what I'm going to kind of concentrate on. And let me, in the first couple of minutes, let me just uh, give a little context uh, about trigonometry. So um, we'll talk about trigonometry uh, and trigonometry of uh, tetrahedra. And one can uh, imagine, so there are several contexts, it can be hyperbolic tetrahedron or Euclidean or spherical, and for different cases, different things are convenient to have in mind. Mostly I will concentrate on hyperbolic, but uh, almost all the results are as interesting for actually the most classical Euclidean tetrahedra or spherical tetrahedra. So uh, all three contexts work. And uh, of course, so we have a tetrahedra and it has four vertices uh, and it has dihedral angles, alpha ij, uh, i from one to four, ij from one to four. Uh, and it has lengths of edges from uh, one uh, to four. So these are kind of main parameters and, uh, and also volume is a third interesting uh, maybe parameter. And the classical question of trigonometry uh, is basically uh, uh, what are relations, are the relations uh, between those. And of course, trigonometry of tetrahedra is extremely classical subject. There are lots and lots of, I think more than 10 or even 20 books solely about this subject. Um, but if you try to see whether there are like theorems which are easy to formulate and giving you a way to answer this, those questions, that's not so easy. Even analogs of sines and cosine theorems are pretty terrifying if you look at them and they don't give you a complete answer. So first I want to start with saying a few things which are elementary, uh, sorry, which are kind of, yes, which are elementary, which are about this, this notions. Uh, but which are hard and not uh, maybe widely known. So just a few results in trigonometry, basically. And then the rest of the talk, I will try to explain them from uh, algebra geometric perspective. So maybe let me start with fact number one, and uh, I will just mention it once, but it might give some context. So volume, unlike angles and edges, is a much more sophisticated object. And um, actually there is a, uh, uh, what's called a Schlafly uh, formula, which is a differential statement. It tells you that if you have a family of tetrahedra, uh, then the differential of the volume uh, times some constant, uh, which I'm not going to specify, uh, equals to some length ij differential of angles. So this gives a differential relation between the parameters and in particular, it implies that the form d l i j, which d alpha i j, is uh, uh, zero. So one can, in a sense, embed tetrahedra in certain twelve-dimensional symplectic space, and it will be Lagrangian six-dimensional subspace there. So I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to discuss it, but so so maybe uh, so that's and this works in H three. This is like independent of your setting. So uh, one should be slightly careful. So this constant will be equal to zero for Euclidean case. And then you will have both statement, but actually they are more uh, simple. Uh, but that means that basically uh, whatever the ideal of relations between angles and edges is, uh, I mean, just to be more algebra geometric, I should say that we expect algebraic relations between exponents of angles and uh, exponents of lengths of edges in a hyperbolic case, for instance, and uh, exponents of angles and just links of edges in Euclidean. So then relations will be algebraic. And uh, I mean, this relation should be such that 
such two form is closed, for instance. So that's a big restriction and kind of interesting one. But this was known from 19th century. So the next statement is uh, much more strange. So the next statement is called uh, Reggie symmetry. And it was discovered by physicist Tullio Reggie in his work on uh, Euclidean quantum gravity. Uh, and uh, in this work, um, Panzano and Reggie were computing asymptotics of uh, so-called 6J symbols in representation theory. And as a kind of, they related it's asymptotic with volumes of certain Euclidean tetrahedra, and they discovered the following fact. So, so fact is as follows. So let's take a tetrahedra and let's suppose that it's given by lengths of edges L12 up to L34. So I'm going to construct out of it a new one with lengths of edges L12 prime up to L34 prime, which are defined by the following linear change of variable. So uh, let, let uh, uh, P be a sum of lengths of edges like everything except one, two, and three, four, uh, uh, one, three, uh, two, four, uh, and uh, one, four over two. And then I just uh, define L12 prime equal to L12, L34 prime equal to L34. And with the rest, I do kind of a reflection uh, of this sort. So I should say that not always such tetrahedra would even exist because you can by chance violate triangle inequalities. Um, one, three, one, four, two, three, two, four. Um, but uh, let's suppose that this T prime exists. And, and in this case, I think about Euclidean keys, but again, it's, it, it's true for any. So then uh, what, uh, what they observed is that actually you can look at dihedral angles of this new tetrahedra. And of course you expect that they should change in a completely complicated way because I mean, the relations between them are very nonlinear, but actually what they showed is that they will change according to absolutely the same formulas. So literally the same where uh, you will have to um, do the same reflection where uh, instead of uh, uh, P you use of course similar sum for angles. Um, and moreover, volume is preserved under this transformation, which is actually easy to deduce from this previous statement and the statement about angles. So basically, if you wish, trigonometry of tetrahedra has a wide group of symmetries, uh, much bigger than, than you would expect. That's kind of fact number two. And finally, fact number three is actually the one which motivated this work. It, it was an observation which motivated this work. So it's the following statement. So, um, so let's look at uh, a tetrahedra and uh, let's denote by P1, P4, just perimeters of faces, perimeters of faces. And uh, omega one, uh, omega four will be spherical angles. So let me remind you that a spherical angle is an angle uh, like an area of a small sphere cut by an angle of a tetrahedra. And you can write it explicitly. So omega one is alpha one, two plus alpha one, three plus alpha one, four minus pi by gauss bonnet formula for a spherical triangle. Uh, and then the statement is that you can take four numbers, e power i omega one, e power i omega two, e power i omega three, e power i omega four, and the cross ratio is the same as cross ratio P1, P2, P3, P4. Uh, sorry, uh, I mean, exponent of P1, exponent of P2, exponent of P3, exponent of P4. So cross ratio of exponents of spherical angles equals to cross ratio of exponents of perimeters. Um, and uh, this is for hyperbolic and for Euclidean, for instance, you put here just perimeter. So- Okay, this, that, thing, this, that, that one is just crazy. That one seems like that is- yeah, yeah, and this one is hard. So even for Euclidean tetrahedra, one can try to prove it directly. And eventually uh, Fyodor Petrov found a proof of the CRM using elementary geometry, and you can find it on mass overflow. There is a discussion of it there, but it's very involved. It's like long computation plus long extra constructions. It's not easy at all. So there is no simple proof known. 
Uh, I will give an algebra geometric explanation. So I have two proofs of this statement and this statement, which are kind of related uh, and, and, and this Regis symmetry statement. And one of them uses mixed Hodge structures and another uses uh, algebraic geometry. And I'm going to kind of talk about mostly algebra geometric, but also will mention a Hodge theoretic one. But elementary proof is kind of also interesting to find a simpler one. Um, actually, a more refined statement is true. Let me say a more refined statement. So this is fact three, but maybe like with a little prime here, uh, uh, which is, I think, maybe a, it's, it's more complicated to say, but it's also, I think it's more pretty actually. So let's look at eight numbers. So four of them will be exponents of angles. And, um, and the other uh, three will be uh, exponents of, uh, and then I just add up angles in a tetrahedra, which uh, corresponds to edges um, going along kind of a Hamiltonian path in this graph. So just four edges except two opposites. And I have an expression like alpha one, two, alpha two, three, alpha three, four, alpha four, one, and uh, similar another two such quantities corresponding to other such pairs of opposite edges. And also I take one. And similarly, I can look at exponent of uh, perimeter one, exponent of perimeter two, exponent perimeter three, four, and then exponent of similar somewhere, I take lengths of edges instead of angles, just in, along the same uh, curve. And one. And the statement is that there exists a unique, uh, uh, there exists a unique uh, uh, a fractional linear transformation psi, which sends this eight numbers to that eight numbers. So like sending each to each. And in particular, any cross ratio of any four numbers on the left equals to the cross ratio of any four numbers on the right. So you start to have a lots of relations like that. And uh, does that make sense? That's, that's clear. And finally, uh, so as I said, one can combine it. So there is this Regis symmetry statement and there is this uh, uh, transformation. And one can preserve, do Regis symmetry. And actually this statement is invariant under Regis symmetry, uh, but one can look at a slightly bigger group. So let's consider a group uh, acting on um, angles and edges, just as tuples, which is generated by uh, S4, just usual tetrahedral relabeling of vertices, uh, Regis symmetry. Uh, this group will be like size 170 maybe, uh, but also let's add to it a transformation which sends alpha one, two to minus alpha one, two, alpha three, four, uh, sorry, and, and L one, two to L, uh, uh, to minus L one, two. So it's kind of a strange transformation which doesn't make sense geometrically. It reverses the angle and uh, length of each sign. But uh, I mean, you will see algebra geometrically where it comes from. It's, it's very natural from that perspective. Uh, and then we generate a group which one can look at. And that's actually a group of order to 22,000 something, uh, 22,000 uh, something. And that's a wild group of type D6, of a root lattice of type D6. And this group acts on all formulas of trigonometry, sending correct formulas to correct formulas. And in particular, we can take a statement, in fact, three prime and start acting by this while, while group and get different like relations again. So you have a couple of thousands of different trigonometric relations coming from this, for instance, by applying this symmetry group. So this is like a geometric uh, 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 statements I want to explain and, and prove. That, that's my kind of goal. Um, any, any questions? I think there's a, let's see, there, there are some, there's a question SO12. I'm not sure SO12. Oh, I was just trying to remember which group D6 was. Oh, <laughs> you know, honestly, just... honestly, this will be not the, the way it's related. So it, I will relate it slow through, uh, while group will appear as like uh, acting on Picard group of certain rational elliptic surface. 
So yeah. it's not, it, it will appear not through uh, Lie algebra, Lie group story, but it's SO12 at sequence. Okay, super, thanks. Any other questions? Can you show me fact one just briefly one more time? Is this one or a previous one? The very first one, uh, the very first fact. Uh, the very first Schlafly? Yes, that, that's one. Okay, great. Just thought it is great. Okay, just because the L's, I'm trying to get the symplectic. There's there's some extra bit of. Okay, there's the, that symplectic that DLI. That, yeah, okay. That the fact I'm trying to. There's some huge structure being suggested by all this, and I'm just it just seems mind blowing. I'm trying to put them in the. I'm unsuccessfully trying to put them into into boxes. Sorry, go I, on. I I will do that. I will do that for you. A little soon enough. Right. So let me maybe immediately do uh, a change to algebra geometric setting because uh, I mean this is all hyperbolic geometry, but actually it's it's just a ver it's there is an algebra geometric version. So just let's let's look at algebra geometric version. Um, so so actually. Uh, let, let me just give a definition, maybe. So, a projective tetrahedron uh, is a configuration of uh, a quadric Q uh, in P3 and four hyperplanes. So basically just a quadric and a collection of four hyperplanes in P3, I will call it projective tetrahedron. And one can draw the picture uh, maybe like that. And then there are these points where the quadric intersects each, each line. So, so this, this pair will be called a projective tetrahedron. Um, and uh, uh, how it's related? So if you take a hyperbolic tetrahedron, for instance, uh, a hyperbolic tetrahedron, if you look at Klein's model, you will have a, a quadric being the projectivization of a sphere. And in Klein's model, the sides of a tetrahedra are uh, actually part of Euclidean plane. And so every hyperbolic tetrahedra, hyperbolic um, tetrahedron uh, defines unique projective tetrahedron. Uh, and uh, and also the same is true for spherical and Euclidean, and that's basically what's called Cayley approach to non-Euclidean geometry, that you can model any non-Euclidean geometry by configuration of a quadric and, uh, and uh, lines, planes, and so on. Mm, so from this perspective, let's see basically what are angles and edges, how to think about that. So, and for this one needs to look at actual formula for a length of edge in hyperbolic geometry, and the formula is that if you have a um, if you have a hyperbolic um, hyperbolic case, you have two points, maybe x, y, and two points where the line passing through them intersects the quadric, and then the uh, relation is that exponent of twice length of edge between x and y uh, is equal to cross ratio of points x e one y e two. So. Basically, since my formulas are relating uh, exponents of lengths of edges and exponents of angles, one should intuitively think that uh, what we are roughly talking about is a configuration of a quadric and uh, this collection of, of four planes. And I'm interested in cross ratios of the corresponding uh, points where uh, I take vertices of this tetrahedra and, and the points where quadric intersect the lines. And uh, if one look, wants to do, uh, look at angles, then uh, uh, if, if uh, uh, so, if this tetrahedra has vertices a1, a2, a3, a4, and uh, I want to look at angles, then what I do, I pass to the dual. So I look at the dual space, dual quadric, and then I look at dual um, hyperplanes. And uh, actually, lengths of edges of the dual will correspond to angles of the original. It's especially well visible in uh, spherical geometry where this duality will be actually realized as like looking at big diameters. 
And in uh, Euclidean and hyperbolic, it's not that visible because the dual one doesn't fly in this geometry. It's kind of something weird. But uh, from the projective perspective, it doesn't matter. So that's, uh, uh, that's just a remark. And basically, one can think that we are just starting this configurations of a quadric and hyperplanes. And we look at the dual configuration of a dual quadric and dual hyperplanes. And we want to understand how their natural invariants, projective invariants, are related. So that's just classical reformulation of, of trigonometry uh, using algebraic geometry. Um, and by the way, from this perspective, I said that uh, I said that uh, uh, there is this, a little strange transformation uh, here, which changes a sign of the length of edge, for instance. And in this picture, it's completely natural because if you take a configuration of uh, if you take a configuration of uh, these four planes and a quadric and look at a pair uh, of points where uh, uh, a line intersects a quadric, there is no natural ordering. And so uh, actually you can reverse them and this will invert the cross ratio and this will flip the sign of the lengths. So from algebraic perspective, to talk about lengths of edges, you need to separately choose orderings of intersections of lines with, with quadric. And basically changing this orientation, this ordering uh, uh, is exactly a part of this uh, symmetry group, which I, uh, I did. So from the, so basically from the algebra geometric perspective, a natural symmetry group would be as four semi-direct product with z over two z power six. Um, and then register symmetry adds a wild component to it, adding something which is not visible in this algebra geometric picture yet. Okay, I, I, you already answered that, right? The register symmetry still is mysterious. It's still not. Yes, yes. It, so, so this, this actually, this, uh, this perspective doesn't explain neither of, of the results. It just tells you that uh, you can generalize it and you can treat all geometry simultaneously, and uh, it explains where this sign change comes from. Um, okay, so now let me actually formulate the, the main uh, theorem. Uh, and uh, for this, I need a, a very brief, in this seminar, uh, super brief <laughs> reminder about rational elliptic surfaces. So, um, uh, so now let's talk for a little bit about rational elliptic surfaces. So, So what I mean by that here is just I take a pair of elliptic curves and I look at nine points of their intersection and uh, uh, and I blow blow them up and I get a surface X which is rational elliptic surface. Um, so uh, so what can we say in general about this kind of object? So firstly, this is actually rational elliptic surface, meaning X is rational. Uh, and, uh, um, and X, uh, there is an elliptic, elliptic structure there. There is a map to P1, uh, which is actually anti-canonical in your system. And you can think of it as just, uh, its fibers are the uh, elliptic curves in the span. So you just take a linear combinations of, of these two elliptic curves, you get other curves and uh, they uh, form uh, fibers. So, uh, and let me just draw it. So I have P1 and I have this, this rational, sorry, this rational elliptic surface and it's fibered uh, by elliptic, uh, elliptic curves. Uh, so um, in general, the number of parameters of such surfaces, so the dimension, uh, the number of, let me, let me be less formal. So number of parameters, uh, is equal to eight, uh, equals to eight. Uh, and that's easy to see because basically you can fix four points here lying in P2 and then um, choose any other four points and the ninth point will be well-defined uniquely by this point where all uh, elliptic curves intersect passing through the first eight. So we have two times four is eight. Uh, and moreover, uh, another important thing is that if you look at generic rational elliptic surface, uh, a generic one will have 12 fibers, 12 singular fibers. And uh, the singular fibers will be, uh, will be nodal curves, nodal elliptic curves. 
And again, it's general kind of this gram of Wheaton and variance computation that's through nine points in general position, which are so eight points in general position, uh, there are exactly 12 uh, uh, nodal elliptic curves possible. Um, so I'm, I need a slightly less general rational elliptic surface because tetrahedra have six parameters after all. So I want to look at a co-dimension two subfamily of rational elliptic surfaces. So let me define, so I will call it uh, an, uh, a D6, a D6 surface uh, is a triple of um, a rational elliptic surface X uh, and a pair of fibers, which I will call F1, F2 um, of type I2. So there is a scalar classification of singular fibers and I1, uh, uh, sorry, I, 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 I1 is uh, basically nodal curve and I2 is a case where the fiber is degenerate and it's just a union of two rational, uh, rational curves. And a typical picture is that, for instance, if you want to get such D6 surface, you can just take a conic and a line and intersect it with another conic and a line and you think of them as a pair of elliptic curves and you take the pencil. So these two unions of conics and lines will give you a pair of uh, these fibers F1 and, and, and F2, which are pairs, which are, which are uh, reducible. Um, so, and uh, I will explain in a second where D6 comes from, but uh, uh, just counting parameters, it's clear that, that the, uh, the number of parameters now is two less parameters equals to six because basically uh, requiring for uh, appearance of this fiber of this type is co-dimension one condition and another appearance of another fiber is co-dimension one condition. Um, so now my surface looks like this. So I have actually a pair of the special fibers and that's fiber F1. And let me name the curves F11, F12. And there is another fiber uh, F2 where my curves are maybe F21, F22. So, okay. And, and uh, then uh, other fibers can be arbitrary. So there can be some degenerations between them. Uh, it doesn't, most generally uh, there will be uh, eight other fibers which are nodal curves, but maybe they will degenerate in some way. So now, um, so this is a D6 surface and the name comes from the following reason. So if you look at Picard lattice uh, of, of the rational elliptic surface, uh, this lattice is Z10 and um, it actually has a special vector, which is this class of the uh, uh, minus canonical class, which is this class of the fiber. Uh, and this vector has a property that it squares to zero simply because you can move it. So it's, it's a fiber of this uh, elliptic vibration. So uh, And if you look at the orthogonal complement to F quotient by F, so F is inside the orthogonal complement. So this will be um, Z8 and with intersection pairing, which is well-defined there, this is E8 lattice, lattice of type E8. Uh, and also, uh, so this components F11, F12, F21, F22 are roots in the lattice. So it's actually easy to see that if you take a, a irreducible component of a reducible fiber, it always gives you a root uh, uh, in this uh, in this lattice, so one of these 240 roots. So basically, uh, I have a pair of special roots, and let me call one of them maybe R uh, A and R L. This will be one one class of uh, maybe F11, and this will be class of, of F21, for instance. So just a class of of one of these curves and the class of the other. Uh, so they are orthogonal, of course, because the curves don't intersect. And uh, now I can look at their uh, common orthogonal complement. So this is a pair of roots inside E8, and I take a pair and they are orthogonal, and I take a complement 
uh, and and actually this in this case will be a, a lattice uh, z, z6 and this will be a lattice uh, lattice of type d6 so finally we have d6 in the appearance and that's why I called d6 surface um, so how can we parameterize such surfaces so we have the six dimensional modular space and, and the question is how to parameterize it. So here is a classical idea, which is actually, I mean, I read it in the papers by Loyenha. So I, I know it says Loyenha period map, but maybe, I mean, maybe in some way it's appeared before. And actually I think the first kind of, the first appearance of this kind of invariance is uh, due to Kelly. So, um, so let's, let's see how to parameterize it. So there is a very natural way. So let's take, uh, uh, let's take this lattice. Let me call it maybe Z of D6. I mean, I mean this particular one. And then I have this lattice. Uh, and uh, then if I have a, an element there, uh, uh, then I can think of it as a divisor which restricts trivially to each component of each uh, curve. Uh, uh, out of this F11, F12, F21, F22. And so I can look at it uh, uh, as a divisor and just restrict it uh, uh, to the fiber F1. And I will get an element of peak node uh, of, of F1 as a reducible elliptic curve. So, uh, and, and also I can do the same thing with F2. And uh, now, if I fix maybe some choice of the singular points here, I will get actually an identification. So this will be just both C star. And, um, and I have this two maps, which are maps from six dimensional lattice to C star, which basically is collection of, I mean, roughly speaking, six complex numbers up to some uh, uh, group action. And, uh, uh, and these are parameters. So actually there is a CRM which is called Maybe some some version of Torelli theorem, which tells you that uh, if you if you know these parameters, you can reconstruct the surface. I mean, one should be slightly careful. There is some marking one should add, but like up to discrete invariance, you can reconstruct the surface, and you can make it a exactly one to one uh, correspondence. So, so is this a, it's is this going to be a ball quotient? Is this and the, these are actual? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question. So that's I don't think it's known, and I think it's very important to know, and I think uh, it should be. So uh, this all Toledo and uh, like uh, Alcock Toledo type, type argument should be should be possible here and should be very interesting uh, and should be related to quantization of, of the story. But I, I don't uh, I mean I don't I know nothing about how it should work. So it's 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 one of the possible directions of further investigation. Um, and let me just say what this what the things look like roughly. So if you have a root you can show that you can represent any root as a difference of a pair of sections. So sections are minus one curves on the surface and, and roots are, are basically the difference of sections. And I mean, you can represent them in this way. And then if you look at such root represented by a difference of sections, the value of the period maps will be cross ratios of four points uh, where the sections intersect the corresponding components of the, of the fiber. So uh, basically, this period map is computing for you out of a pair of sections intersecting uh, uh, the like the same component on left and right. It computes this cross ratios uh, on left and right. So that's that's the meaning of the Yen period. So it really is explaining why the period map and the cross it is the cross the cross ratios come up again, just in yes. the most natural of ways. Okay. Yes, exactly. So now now here is a theorem, which is the main theorem. So for every, um, and then one can put, so let me say hyperbolic for now, because I just won't formulate it this way, but you can take a, take anything, projective that I put on Euclidean. No, no with Euclidean, there is a subject. Uh, so let's say spherical or projective. So, or hyperbolic or this projective defined before, probably hyperbolic uh, tetrahedron uh, T, there exists a unique, uh, rational elliptic surface. Let me call it X sub T. Uh, uh, and um, a, uh, uh, a collection of six roots 
R, I, J, I from one to four uh, in this Z of D6. Uh, so actually these roots will be pairwise orthogonal. So, so they will be pairwise orthogonal. Um, uh, such that uh, if you take any root and apply to it the restriction map to the first fiber, you will get exponent of the length of edge of your uh, tetrahedra. And if you take the same root and apply the restriction to the second fiber, you will get exponent of the dihedral angle. So that's, that's the main result. So a way to think about it is as follows. So if you have this D6 surface, you have two different period maps and they give you two different ways to parameterize your variety of such surfaces. And according to the Starelli theorem, both are basically, uh, um, roughly speaking, one-to-one. -one. And you can ask how to compute one when you know another. What is the relation between the values of two period maps corresponding to different fibers? And the answer is the relations are exactly the same as the relations in trigonometry of tetrahedron. So that's one way to say it. Uh, so this immediately implies regisymmetry statement. Because if you just know that, then you have a wild group of D6 acting on Picar lattice. Uh, uh, I mean, this is a stabilizer of these fibers and it acts on the Z of D6. And uh, since both maps restrictions are linear, uh, if you apply this map, you will see basically the same transformation for angles and lengths of edges. So, so currently this is, um, why? Is this true it, just by vast miracle and conspiracy of nature that you just have to brutally check? Or I, I, this seems like an amazing fact. Um, so let me put it this way. So uh, I have two, I have the original way where it came from. And this original, it's, it's also a little bit of a miracle, but I can sort of give a proof, which is roughly like three lines in a sense, well, not three lines, but like five lines of the CRM but it's completely mysterious and it's used mixed hot structures. Uh, and I can give a proof, which is more or less a direct computation, uh, which is uh, five pages of, of uh, computations. So as there is no natural explanation. And I will say in a sense, what in a second, what is the construction of the surface? You will see it's very, it's elementary birational construction. It's not, not hard at all, but it has surprising properties which are not easy to see uh, in any standard way. So, but you, yeah, the fact is mysterious. It's not in any way, uh, it's not in any way expected. It's like one of the slow dimensional coincidences. So it's, it's this kind of thing. So uh, is this a fair question? Like what might a virus for us presentation of the rational elliptic surface have any meaning in terms of the tetrahedron? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, fair enough. That's a natural question to ask, but I have not found any connection directly, but I have not tried. I, I will tell you roughly like what I know and the rest I don't basically. So I'm, okay, pretty, sure. Sure, I'm pretty sure there is a lot about this construction which, which can explain like various parts of it. So um, mostly, mostly it's mysterious. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. So can you, say me, how to, can you say how to get Reggie's symmetry from this? I mean, can, do, do you need a converse to this theorem as well? So that uh, you go backwards from... Yes, yes, probably. So, so actually, uh, let, me, let me say that if you, if you do the theorem slightly more carefully, uh, then you will have a bijection between uh, tetrahedra and uh, rational elliptic surface. You need to take projective tetrahedra. You need mm -hmm. to take uh, uh, in account, like mark the sort of points of intersection of lines with quadric. And on the surface, you need to choose a marking, which is all the data of identifying Picard lattice with a standard one, and then and made a little bit extra general position assumption. And then it will be bijection. It will be one-to-one -one correspondence. So you will have inverse to this as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and this, but uh, yeah, so the, and this would imply Regis symmetry. Uh, I should say that, by the way, the actually proof of Regis symmetry statements and hyperbolic statement is uh, geometry is actually hard and it appeared only basically at the same month as I, I, I was working on this. So there is a proof by uh, Akapian and, and Ismestiev, which is elementary, but pretty involved in hyperbolic geometry and, and uh, it's more or less simultaneous. Um, so so let, me, let me explain maybe a few, a few more things about this correspondence. 
So, so this was basically this fact, fact two, how it follows from, from, uh, from the theorem. Uh, fact three, this equality of cross ratios also follows. And let me just show that. So basically the idea that if you have this rational elliptic surface, you have a- Actually, would you mind just going back and showing us fact three again? Yeah, so it's, so it's this, this statement, this, this- uh, Ah, great. Eight, eight points. The, uh... Eight points, yeah. And, and you can see here first that this actually, this combinations from the perspective of what we have now, they are certain roots of E8. I mean, the, the, one can actually write down explicitly the E8 lattice kind of from tetrahedra. I will maybe say a few words about that. So, uh, so basically, this is a values, these are all values of my period map on different roots. So, all of them are uh, on left and right. Uh, two different period maps and certain combinations of roots. And where this comes from is actually um, the following. Uh, algebra geometrically, it's, it's standard. So if you have this elliptic fibration, you have also structures which are called uh, conic bundle structures uh, where it's kind of goes transversely, where a fiber of this, uh, of this maps are um, in general just P1s. But uh, such conic bundles on the rational elliptic surface will have reducible fibers as well. And in ge a generic one will have basically 12 reducible fibers, sorry, eight reducible fibers. So it has eight reducible fibers, fibers, which look like basically a pair of rational, um, rational curves, which intersect, uh, intersect the fibers in this pattern. So, so this is kind of the picture. And then you can look at the corresponding singular fibers. And let me say that they suppose they project to points um, uh, P1, P2, and so on, P8. And you have these eight fibers. And you can look at what are the points of intersection of these fibers. Let me call this map something. So this will be C. And I can look at C inverse of P1 up to C inverse of P8. And I can intersect these points with F11. And I can look simultaneously at points of intersection of this um, with F21, for instance. And in this way, I get eight points on P1. And also this P1 is, you know, this is, I mean, if I look at the corresponding P1, I have this zero and infinity basically chosen. So I can think of this as a collection of eight numbers. And can you, say, uh, can you say again where, what the depth, what, how, where C came from? I mean, so uh, there are actually a, a, a big collection. The Weil group acts on them, but you, uh, I mean, there is this. The statement is that there exists a map to P1, uh, which intersects uh, the generic fiber, intersects uh, each fiber with multiplicity two. And okay, so you have some, some particular linear system, collection of linear, finite set of linear, uh, linear systems? Yeah. So there exists this, this natural choice of linear systems on the rational elliptic surface. And of course, in this case, I need to take one very particular if I fix all the six roots I mentioned before and so on, but let me not specify which. I mean, well, one can choose one. Uh, and, um, and then one gets uh, two tuples of eight points and uh, they are projectively equivalent because my map C just identifies them. So that's why I get this fractional linear transformation. But actually the concrete, concrete transformation depends on basically a point where the singular points of the fibers project and we have little control over them. So they are like just some points. And so you have a some fractional linear transformation which is not so easy to, to compute actually these coefficients. I mean, one can, there is a way, but they are, they are not given by any simple formulas. So this, uh, 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 so this is um, this is uh, the way you can see this cross ratio equalities. And actually, if you take instead of rational elliptic surface a cubic surface, and you do all the similar construction with a period map and look at the such cross ratios uh, of points of intersection of this conic bundle with a fiber, uh, that uh, cross ratios are known as Cayley invariants. So on a cubic surface, it's a picture where you take a line on a cubic surface and take uh, uh, five triangles intersecting with five triangles of lines 
intersecting with it and take any four and take cross ratio. And that's, that was defined by Kelly. And these are exactly this cross ratios of exponents from the very beginning, like this type of invariance are basically exactly this invariance computed through one or, uh, or another period map. So, so that, that is their algebra geometric meaning. Um, so let me maybe, so uh, any questions about this kind of thing? So the most, so the question is, is uh, how uh, uh, T tetrahedron and, uh, and the surface XT are related. So, I mean, I said this one relation with, uh, one relation with uh, lengths of edges uh, coming from period maps and angles. Uh, so the most, um, so firstly, let me maybe say this mixed hot structure relation. So um, the statement is that if you take tetrahedron T and I think of it as P3, quadric and hyperplanes, I can look at the mixed hot structure H3 uh, of P3 minus quadric relative to the union of hyperplanes minus quadric. So this Betika homology group has a mixed hot structure and it's of mixed state type. So the quotient there will be Q of zero, Q of minus one power six and Q of minus two. And if you look, and it's triple extensions, like a tower of extension. And if you look at this extensions coming from here and this extensions, so this extensions will give you basically angles uh, and edges. Sorry, this, this will be uh, edges, lengths of edges, and this will be angles. Um, and the kind of the total thing as a period will have basically volume. So you can see trigonometry is coming from like period matrix of this mixed hot structure. That's a discovery, I think. I mean, I learned it from Goncharov. I think it's Goncharov uh, observation. Um, and this is true for any hyper di higher dimensional uh, polytopes as well. So you can see sort of mixed hot structure is exactly the data uh, of trigonometry. And by the way, uh, from this perspective, Schlafly relation, uh, uh, relation is exactly uh, uh, Griffith's transversality. So it's, it's literally, uh, literally that. It's again due to Goncharov. Um, but one can so, also- so, so, can I, so you're saying in higher dimension as well, like in any number of dimensions, you have um, like versions of dihedral angles that are, and versions of, that are like K dimension, you have like a K out of N and you have version of dihedral angles and you have version of areas and all those things are contained mm -hmm. in, uh, are contained in, a longer um, filtration of yes, of, exactly, of sort of exactly. Tate of Tate typeish. Really, it's not the Hodge; it's the weight stuff. It, yes, it's weight extensions. That's amazing. Yes, it's okay. it's it's exactly it's exactly the case. So that's actually uh, there is this Goncharov's approach to Caesar congruence of polytops, which explains that the famous Den invariant of a polytop is actually exactly the co-product of the corresponding uh, framed mixed hot structure in the category of, in the Hopf algebra of framed mixed hot structures. So it's, it's like explains a lot in Caesar congruence business. Mm, so, and, and, and then one can look at, at XT and it has also cohomology of XT minus one of the fiber relative to another fiber. And uh, it actually has the same kind of quotients. And the statement is that these uh, mixed hot structures are just the same. I mean, um, and this is a relation. And let me explain how it conceptually explains what's going on. Because conceptually, it explains because on, on mixed hot structures, there is something called Verdia duality, which basically, uh, roughly speaking, uh, uh, if you take a smooth projective variety and a pair of divisors which don't intersect, this the duality kind of will exchange the role of the divisors uh, of the divisors, mm, and if you look at this mixed hot structure, uh, you can also kind of exchange the role of divisors. But there is another way to see that that uh, what what the duality does there, and actually the Verdier duality here will correspond to exactly passing to the dual tetrahedron. And that's again, not hard to see, like elementary geometry, it's just that you know, for duality in spherical trigonometry, like angles are exchanged with lengths of edges. 
and volume doesn't change almost, and that's basically a transposition on the period matrix. So it's, it's, it's not a terribly surprising statement. But if you combine them, it means that if you construct a surface where basically this uh, identification holds, then you might expect that dual tetrahedral will have the same surface, just the role of F1, F2 will exchange. And that's basically the, the thing with the same with this cross ratio equality. So that's kind of a Virgia duality sort of statement in a sense. If you construct a surface which has this equality of mixed structures, uh, then, then uh, it will, uh, any, its invariant will be kind of symmetric in angles and lengths of edges in a sense. Um, any questions about this? So the second thing that he mentioned of Gontrov may have answered a much more basic question I had, which is, okay, so under scissors congruence, at least tetrahedra, Euclidean tetrahedra, maybe it's the same for others, I don't know, have this invariant in the block group uh, that answers Hilbert's problem and all that. And like, how, how many of the invariants that you're telling me about factor through that map algebra K theory? Like, are, are the cross ratios visible in that? Or is this like an orthogonal thing that you're telling me about? Do these stories fit together? No, it's it's actually it's actually very re related. So the whole story started uh, with uh, my attempt to understand the Caesar congruence class of a spherical tetrahedra, and its explicit expression in block group. And uh, basically, there was a formula which I found which gave that. And uh, I tried to understand this formula, and it, it, it was a special case of what's called strong Sosslin reciprocity law in K theory. And if you kind of look at the strong Sosslin uh, reciprocity law, it predicts the equality of lengths of edges and angles, which is basically the statement about eight, eight numbers. Gotcha. gotcha. So see. this was, was a kind of a history. And, and uh, then I tried to explain it, and then this Verdia duality kind of argument key. I mean, key. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, so, so sorry, is, is there a direct map from uh, the class of rational elliptic surfaces that you're looking at to this algebraic K theory, to this block group? So and can you describe? Uh -huh. Uh, it's 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 like you you want to associate to a mixed hot structure with framing. Framing is just mm -hmm. the choice of yeah, yeah, sure. so you want to associate to it an element of, of the block group B2. And yes. basically the idea is that if you take if you look at tetrahedra, that's doing that is extremely hard. It's not uh, naturally kind of easy to write down. The formula is very complicated. But if you look at the surface, the formula is simple, it will involve uh, the coefficients of this psi fractional linear transformation, basically. Oh. So, so it's, it's this psi is exactly kind of the thing which you need to know, and and uh, its its uh, coefficients are this extra irrationalities you need to basically add to be able to write down your volume formula or like sister congruence class. Oh my God! Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, so let me. So I, I have like. Um, two things I want to say. One thing is boring and the other is extremely fun. So uh, let me just maybe do the fun. Let me say, so there is a birational construction of the surface, which I- Maybe why don't you go ahead and say both? Yeah, uh, how much time do I have then? I mean- Well, officially two minutes, but let, we can stretch. Maybe go for a few more minutes and then pause and then people can leave if they, if okay. they have to go and then go a little bit more. How's that? Okay, sure. So let me, let me try to- do anything in like five, seven minutes. So first, let me then just finish the whole story by saying what is the construction of XT. And it's, it's very simple, but it doesn't explain a single property of it. So the construction is as follows. So you take this tetrahedra and, um, uh, and, uh, and you take this points of intersection of, of the tetrahedra with the quadrant, of edges with the quadrant. So, this gives you a collection of 12 points uh, on the quadric, which is P1 cross P1. And, uh, uh, and of course, it's natural to blow them up. So now we can go from P1 cross P1 to some rational surface R by blowing up this points of intersection of HI intersect HJ intersect with the quadric. So this surface will be not rational elliptic surface. It's like a few degrees uh, more than needed. So we need to blow something down to go to XT. But the problem is that there are choices and there are various choices what one can blow down. So let me just draw in a picture what one can blow down. And this is just one of the choices. There are many, many others. And it's not clear. They give all isomorphic surfaces, but it's not so easy to see. 
So um, um, one of the choices is as follows. You blow down uh, one of the divisors you blew up, just like by mistake. Uh, then you blow down a one-one curve passing through the three points of intersection. Uh, and then you blow down a pair of uh, generators of P1 cross P1 passing through this point. Oh, wait, uh, am I saying it's right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Hopefully, I, I might have confused something, yeah, like something like that. So it's, it's very simple operation, but if you and 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 basically uh, the kind of most rigorous proof of this uh, theorem I had before was just for me to kind of pass through this construction and and uh, and see that cross ratios are uh, equal to the corresponding uh, parameters of tetrahedra, but uh, it doesn't explain anything. And if you try to even change the ordering of sides, if you just do a different point as a first point, you will get isomorphic surface. But uh, I don't have a natural simple algebra geometric proof. For some transformations, it's more easy. It's, they are a little bit like they are kind of a special case of this type uh, of involutions of, of uh, Del Pezzo surfaces, like uh, Bertini involution and so on. But like for some of them, it's more complicated. And I very much hope that someone who is a like actual algebraic geometer will, will uh, make sense out of it. Because right now, the construction is not invariant. And also, let me just say a word of caution. So one can try to do something much more natural blow down something in a more symmetric fashion. Everything I tried so far didn't work and uh, a few other people also tried. So there is something, something there is it, 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 like the most obvious things at least don't give a direct, uh, it's the correct surface. So, uh, and this asymmetric choice gives and, and I don't quite understand how. Uh, the way I came up with this result was by actually studying mixed cost structure and computing formula for volume uh, as an integral and kind of analyzing uh, this integral and, and doing some transformations with it. And that led to rational surface. And then kind of, it was, I, I was, uh, I saw how it's related. Um, so, but I very much hope there will be some nice construction of this correspondence, which will explain this E8 lattice and uh, other things from the tetrahedral perspective, for instance. Um, so and by the way, uh, you can you can you can see that Reggie symmetries are actually some na natural birational transformations of p1 cross p1. So one can sort of understand these transformations as kind of a um, uh, geyser involutions. I forgot the name. I'm pronouncing it wrong. In a, in a, when you do you take p1 cross p1 and you blow up maybe several points and then you blow down uh, uh, certain uh, generators passing through them. So this kind of Transformations, so you can exp you can see uh, you can see that that uh, Reggie symmetries are those from this perspective. Uh, okay, so the last part is just a couple of minutes, purely historical. So there was a, some discovery more closer to history, which I uh, uh, which I did already after the paper was actually printed. So it was much later. Uh, so for a long time, I was kind of worried that this statements about Euclidean tetrahedra they should be known to humanity in some form. And I was not able to find anything um, until at some moment I found kind of a trace. So there was a mathematician named Joseph Wolstenholm. So I don't think his name is that known. Uh, so he was uh, living in uh, late 19th century, 19th century uh, in Cambridge. And he was mostly famous as, um, as examiner in Cambridge. So he was one of the people who were in charge of this famous Cambridge uh, tripus examinations and which was this crazy, very horrible, compli complicated exams. And he was uh, author of many books about them and so on. And uh, at some moment he uh, uh, left Cambridge University because of some, uh, I think personal issues and some conflicts. And he was working in engineering college and he started to work on trigonometry of tetrahedra. And he was publishing problems uh, in, um, in uh, the local uh, London Journal of Education called Educational Times, where he was publishing problems about tetrahedra. And his problems uh, with time were becoming closer and closer in style to what I, uh, uh, I mean, to, to the facts I was talking about. Uh, and uh, basically uh, when it comes to, um, uh, so at, at some moment he uh, 
uh, uh, he died. And uh, after that, uh, this journal uh, published uh, a problem which is uh, already kind of after, after his death. So let me show you the problem um, uh, just in a second, uh, because it's pretty remarkable. Um, okay, so uh, let me share the screen. Um, so just one second. Uh, I'm going to share it in a different, uh, like the screen where I'm talking right now. Uh, so mm, here is the. Uh, do, do you see my screen? Yeah. So, okay. So, so there's a problem named 13605, which is um, actually the, the journal contains amazing amount, like incredible amount of problems, which are very interesting kind of with classical algebraic geometry mixed with elementary geometry. And, uh, and basically you can see there are a statement which looks very much like, uh, like the statement I have. And when I saw it at first, I was sure that it will be exactly the one. But apparently it's completely different. So it's a statement that you can, uh, you can it's also a statement that uh, there is a projective transformation, but it's between six tuples, which are sine squares of sums of opposite uh, lengths of edges, sine squared of differences of opposite lengths of edges, and the same for, 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 for all six. And uh, this, uh, they are in projective equivalence. And, uh, and basically, I don't know of elementary proof of that. And actually, I have not even proved it with algebraic geometry, uh, which is, should be doable. It's some statement about rational elliptic surfaces. And this statement is invariant under uh, while group of type D6. Uh, while group will act as a six semi direct with z over uh, 5z on this tuple, which is this classical presentation for while group of type D6. So the, the statement doesn't change, it's equivariant. So unlike the statement about eight points, but it's certainly of the similar nature. And you can read, there is a little passage, which I think is very emotional uh, uh, from Joseph Fostenholm, which is in square brackets underneath the problem. So he says that, I think I have now accomplished all I can in the theory of the tetrahedron and propose to uh, perturb the study for some time. There is, however, still a great deal to be done in the goniometry of the tetrahedron, and I expect some, sometimes the theory of elliptic functions will start from it. I'm too old and broken to have any hope of accomplishing this myself, or I would not divulge the idea. So I don't know what he meant by elliptic functions, but uh, yeah. And, and last- yeah, so, so presumably there is, presumably he did mean something, he had some inkling of some, uh, uh, presumably it was some connection to the elliptic vibration somehow, and yet some equation. Uh, I think that what actually, maybe where, where it might have come, if you look at the formulas, I mean, this k coefficient, which is this extra coefficient of a fractional linear transformation, I think he's sort of interpreting as that looking at elliptic curve with this module, basically. So that, that, I think this is like okay, where okay. it might, but I'm not sure. Um, let me just say last thing. So there are two reasons why people know Wassenholm, and they have nothing to do with mathematics. One of them is that uh, he was a brother of uh, Elizabeth Wassenholm Almy, who was <laughs> one of the most famous uh, people, who was one of the most famous people in this suffragist moment in UK. Uh, and, uh, I, I was actually, I actually posted that in the Discord discussion, that that's the, uh, <laughs> that, that I thought there must be some relationship and there's some yes. yes, this is his sister. Yeah. She started to be interested in this movement because uh, her brother was accepted to Cambridge when she was not, and she thought it's uneven. So, so she was kind of starting with that, she started to do it. Uh, and there is another relation. So um, the- We have that one too, it's the, the congruence. Don't... Yes, the congruence is also him, uh, though it's probably yeah. wrongly him. So it's it's kind of, oh. yeah, but I mean, it's he, in his books, it appears as a problem, basically. Um, but there is another relation. So uh, he was a friend of um, uh, Leslie Stephen, uh, and who was studying uh, at uh, Cambridge at the same time with him. And uh, Leslie Stephen was inviting Watson home to his house every summer, though he was writing his, his uh, 
uh, his uh, diaries said Wassenholm is constantly smoking opium and always sad, but he still wants to somehow cheer him up. And he was inviting him to his house. And according to like some papers I read about, about that, uh, he's a prototype of Augustus Carmichael from uh, um, Virginia Wolves to the Lighthouse. So that's how we kind of know uh, of Wassenholm. And his results about Tetrahedra are completely not known. There is no single book mentioning his name. Uh, so they are totally lost. Um, okay, so let me let me maybe end.